Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media and virtual production. Second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. Today, we're going to talk about polarity and <laughs> how it affects audio, uh, among other things. Phase and polarity. We're going to be talking about these things, and we're going to get to the bottom of it, I think. Anyway, we'll see how that goes. Let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Mitch, what do we have? First in from Jeff Cohen in Miami Beach, Florida. What are the insider tricks to running in-ear monitors behind your head? If I do clip it with enough slack to turn my head, it's too bunched up and visible. If I don't, I snag it when I lean back and excess cable length gets tangled in my chair. Help! Go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, I use the uh, 215s, and it's got a little clip. I can't show you because I've got them on, but it slides up the wire to provide a connection uh, or bunch the uh, the cables together so that they don't uh, get loose and flop around. And then the other thing to use, this isn't it, but this is the label for it. Uh, Angry Audio makes a great headphone disconnector that uh, goes on the end of your uh, cable connection and just makes it easier for you to get in and out of the, uh, the headset setup. Go ahead, Nigel. So I do two different things for office hours in the morning. I'm using some of these uh, in-ears that we all, we all like, and they go into uh, a Rode Go 2, which sits in my pocket so I can move about and go backwards and forwards and wander off and get a coffee and not disconnect. And I also use the Angry Audio, but for, for the rest of the day when I'm on calls, I tend to use my in-ear. And I have it attached by one of these kitchen clips to the Angry Audio disconnection. So I do that, and because I have one of these uh, low-slung arms, it magnetically sticks to it perfectly. I didn't realize when Mitch was showing it that the Angry Audio has, uh, it has a mag, it's magnetic. Could you, can you, I was we no, no, rewind here for a second. Oh, it's yeah, magnetic? Yeah, yeah, so if you come back to me, uh, it's like it jumps in. And so if you try and put it the wrong way, what? it will not work, and it will go right and so and then i add this magnetic clip from my kitchen to my arm and it, uh, i never have the problems it's magnetic <laughs> anyway sorry uh, ken that sound you hear is wallets opening everywhere there are also uh, these little clips which you can buy uh, by the 20s or so from amazon and you can stick them all over your all over your wires uh, and they attach to your clothing quite oh, nicely what i find that works really well is i take both headset both both phones and i twist each one of them separately that causes the entire cable to wrap around itself and it doesn't want to unravel and then you can shove that down your shirt between the, uh, the clothing and the and the chair, and it gets out of the way quite nicely, I think. Go ahead, Courtney. What I do, I have one of the IFB standard security IFB type uh, microphone, you know, with the little tube. And I was looking for one to show you a separate one, but I can't find it. But what I do is I, I take the tube and I'm using my right ear uh, is where the, uh, the earpiece goes in. But I have the uh, clip on my collar set with the tube coming out the opposite side as if it's going to the left ear. So it crosses over and that puts enough tension on it to keep the uh, little uh, squiggly clear part uh, behind your head all the time. It keeps enough tension on it. So I find that that works pretty well. And the rest of it is a coily cord that I flip over my shoulder. I go ahead, Arshid. I just wanted to share with that uh, magnetic uh, angry audio piece, uh, Dale Pro Audio has them. Uh, David Brady had mentioned it to me a while back, and that's what I use as well. You could get it into a uh, quarter inch, two quarter inch, or eighth to quarter inch. So there are different uh, adapters you could buy with it at Dale Pro Audio. Next question. Next question in from Lois Richter in Davis, California. New venue. How can I easily find out if the internet connection there is strong and stable for using Zoom? Zoom statistic, statistics, Google search, internet speed test. What numbers do I need for a good Zoom connection? Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, we use uh, speedtest.net. That seems to be an industry standard. Um, it'll tell you you're up and down. The important thing to do, though, is to test it with a, uh, under the circumstances where if there's many more people that are coming to the venue, you test it under load. If you can, if you talk to the network engineer and carve out some some bandwidth just for you. But if it's not your deal, then you're kind of stuck with, with what you get. But I would highly suggest uh, getting there and seeing how many other people are using that internet connection. About 10 megabits is... Uh, what you'd want for your up and down to handle Zoom safely. Um, a little bit more, 20 would be nice for some overhead, but of course, having as much as you can get is always good. Uh, and if you can, have some kind of backup uh, Wi-Fi hotspot type thing uh, to be able to fail over. 
a lot of times we have a router that we have set up and we usually, if we're going to do a real event at a venue, it depends on what, what level of event you're doing. If you're doing something that is more casual, then you do exactly what Guy talked about. If you're doing something that you're getting paid for, a lot of times we ask the venue to let us put a router between their modem and their Wi-Fi. <laughs> so we want to put a router in between it and then we build the VLAN and hand it back to them. So, you know, if, if it's, if they're big enough that they have an IT staff, you don't need to do that. And they won't let you do it. And that's fine. <laughs> you know, like they'll, they'll figure out how to get you the bandwidth that you need. Um, if, but if you're going to a bar or you're going to a little, little coffee house or something like that, usually you can kind of wedge your way in to say, I'm going to be in a thing. And, and I, and, you know, I, I want to be the router between it. And then you hand them back. Now, what I do is I use pep waves and what we do is we put a cellular connection in and we hand the cellular it depends on how much bandwidth they have. They have a ton of bandwidth. We don't do this, but what we used to do is hand the cellular back to their Wi-Fi. <laughs> so the bar gets the Wi-Fi, it gets cellular, uh, gets, gets to share basically a Wi-Fi, and we uh, take over the the ground internet um, from that from that area. Um, if you can't get that, if they don't agree to it, and you don't have a lot of overhead, um, you just want to. I just escalate it to the client. You know, now if you're the client, you can escalate it to yourself, and that won't do as much good. But I just let them know, hey, we might have a problem because this is the problem with the venue. Um, this is what we have to deal with. Um, and um, and we make sure that, you know, we, we place the venue in front of the bus. <laughs> you know, for, if, if we don't, if we don't get what we need to make sure that, that it is, uh, it's not us doing that. So, um, you know, you, if you're doing it for, for you know, for a, a relatively well-paid job, you want to be pretty aggressive about your internet, you know, and um, you want to be nice about it, but but you want to get try to push really hard for what you want to get. Uh, next question. From Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, PA. What is a good solution for microphone in-ear monitors to be connected via a tip ring ring sleeve 3.5 millimeter jack into a phone for mic and IFB? Is there a good all-in-one with TRS or should I use a splitter and separate the in-ears and the mic? Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, that means that there are four connections on that little, uh, a little clip and they're used for... Uh, uh, mic and headphones all on the same uh, connector. If you're looking for an adapter, uh, Rode makes a number of them that will uh, uh, adapt to various uh, iPhones. I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I know that's a good place to search. Yeah, and, and I think that the, you can usually find them, it, it, you know, it depends. The mic just needs to be, you have to decide whether it's a line or whether it needs to be powered. Those things become complicated if you plug it into the phone. So um, that's the that's the real challenge there. Um, but you can definitely there's lots of cables out there that'll go TRRS, and then they'll split out and they'll have a headphone jack and a and an XLR. But that XLR oftentimes needs to dynamic usually not loud enough for it. I mean it just doesn't have enough gain. Um, and uh, so usually you want a line input to make that actually work. Next question from David Brady in New York, New York. End of year shopping. If you had the choice between an A10 Mini SDI Extreme and an A10 2ME, which would it be? Pros and cons of the two. Is there a feature comparison chart available? Go ahead, Tom. I did not find a feature comparison chart, but I'll do a little bit of one right here. Uh, 20 inputs versus 8 and 12 outputs instead of 4. That almost replaces a matrix switch. And then you have the 8 uh, advanced keyers, 2 multi-views, yeah, I think I'd go with the 2ME model. Good guy. Yeah, in addition to what Tom said, do you get a quarter-inch audio jack so that way you're not dealing with the eighth-inch mini plugs? You also get, um, you know, on the extreme, you get the ISO record, so that's probably the biggest differentiator. Do you need to record? Because that alone is worth bucks. So, And then price, you know, you're, there's a $200 spread, $1,495 versus uh, $1,695. And then you get two multi-view outs that are customizable. Those are SDI outs. So if you need SDI or HDMI, you might have to, you know, get some converters. So you need to add that in the budget where you got, um, actually, is the, that's when I didn't check. The, I, I believe the multi-views are SDI on the, on the extreme as well. So yeah, I guess either way, if your monitor's um, HDMI, you're going to need that conversion. The other thing, I mean, rack mount versus, um, you know, the form factor thrown in the rack. And then you also got comms on the front of the uh, 2ME. You don't have that that uh, comms jack if you want to run comms. Not too many people are fans of those comms. And yeah, I was going to say, I was like, wait, have, you, have those ever worked for you? Like, wait, okay. <laughs> I've, I've lost days. I mean, basically, yeah, if you just want to go straight to a camera up, you know, got a small team, it can work. I mean, <laughs> okay. it, it's, yeah. 
I'm sorry. We, we, we spent it. days. We spent two days trying to get the <laughs> the constellation comms to work. We were just through the fiber through the fiber backs. Um, wasn't super successful for us. Anyway, so um, just just curious whether it's working. Have you have you used them? And, and yeah, it, it we, works? we've used okay. them with the studio cameras. Yeah, mm-hmm. okay. they, they work. Yeah. The, through the fiber backs to the Ursas from the constellation, it was it did not work well for us. Um, I love black magic, but that that part hasn't hasn't totally worked its way out. Yeah, I agree with what everybody said. Um, I think that the, the the big the two big factors are what how are you going to control it uh, interface wise? Like so, uh, how are you going to control it? And do you need ISO records? And if you need if you want if you need an interface to push buttons, and you want ISO records, then you want an extreme. If you don't if those two things are not important. If you're going to use a stream deck to run it, um, if you don't need ISO records, then I think it's 100 percent to me. So I agree with what was said earlier. Um, yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah. By the way, that talkback I think only works with Blackmagic designed cameras. I don't think it's going to work on your Sony right. studio right. camera. Right. Um, right. The, other... fiber, the fireback's were, were for the Ursus. It was it was right. fireback to Blackmagic cameras. Uh, the other thing is, I'd love to get this extreme off my desk. So I'm favoring the two me. Back in the rack, and if mm-hmm. I'm worried about uh, a remote controlling a stream deck with a mix effect, works great. Next question from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. He has a link there. Rode has new beta software firmware, excuse me, that allows even more control of the submixes for each output. This gives it, as far as I've seen, the unique ability to feed two encoders with separate feeds. Thoughts? I mean, this is just a. Uh this is a busing, you know, this is very common in, in mixers. Um, just, they usually are higher end mixers. So the road is probably one of the smaller mixers that has multiple buses. But what, what he's talking about is I looked at the video that they had there, by the way, I would recommend looking at the video just because it's a great setup. Like they, they have a setup. I'm pretty sure it's green screen, you know, that, 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 that he's in front of, but, but he's got like a, what looks like a CG background. I don't know if someone can find it and put it up there, but it looks like what, what a CG background of like road with things on the monitors and it's all white and it, but it's kind of, you know, it, it looks, it looks like they, they, someone modeled it, but really matched the focal length and matched everything else. And then keyed him in front of it or something. It, it doesn't, I mean, it, it and I, I couldn't, the key is really good if it, if it, if it is a key, just because I, I couldn't find a lot of issues with it. I just assumed it because the, the, the background looks too real. <laughs> so it looks too perfect, uh, not real. Um, and so uh, anyway, to go back to what they're talking about though, they're just talking about having your, your mixed buses that, you know, that you're, you're just talking about having the, bu- you know, multiple buses. And so that's pretty common for us. It's just that they've made it really simple and they've applied it to a, a relatively um, inexpensive mixer. Um, but it's not a new, it's not a particularly new feature. It's just one that you don't see in little, little mixers very often is to have a, set, uh, a bunch of buses that you can, that you can assign. Um, next question. From Jeff Cohen in Miami Beach, Florida, does anyone know of a DAW, a digital audio workstation, plugin or app that will analyze an audio clip and determine the frequencies of the loudest peaks? Looking for automation, not the manual techniques like EQ sweeping. Right, go ahead, Marty. So I have a bunch of uh, frequency um, analysis meters, spectrum meters, and pretty much all of them have a peak hold function. Um and uh, most of them have a way to determine or set the length of time that that peak uh, will will remain on the screen. Um, I'm trying to think if if there's any one that will actually produce a list. I, I can't think of any, but uh, that would be that would be the way to do it. Javier, I really like Isotope Insight. It has the spectrogram. You it shows you like over time all the different frequencies, like in a very 3D like valleys and 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 uh, you know ups and downs. And so you can really simply look and see where and in, not only in time but in frequency where the loudest peaks are. So it's a super great uh, tool for that. Mitchell. Jeff, this is a little on the outside of your question, but might be applicable. Uh, Waves makes an A4 plug-in, which uh, breaks the frequency ranges up into four different uh, areas. And you can see the individual uh, peaks and valleys and uh, dynamics in each of them. And if you choose to have automation, uh, you can engage the uh, compressor. And all of those dynamics can be adjusted for each range. So it's a uh, multi-EQ range adjusted compressor limiter. Next question. Next question in from Douglas Carmichael. How can you dress your cables neatly when using a pass-through panel in a rack? There's a link to it instead of a patch panel. 
Uh, go ahead, Marty. So you can get a lacing bar, uh, which is um, it's it's a bar that spans the width of the rack, and you can and they, they come straight right across. But you can also get them with an offset, so they're a few inches either in front or in back of the mounting points, depending on which way you mount it. You so you can put this behind the. Uh, the pass through and then secure your wires to that using Velcro, not wire ties. Uh, and then you can span across the width of the rack and bring your, bring your wires through. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah. What Marty said, lacing bar is a good thing. And remember, no, use those tie wraps even on the backside. And I, uh, and of course you only want to tie them down on the backside because Cables going through the outside are going to be moving around anyway, and you don't want to tie them together because then if anybody tugs on one cable, it pulls on all of the cables. So uh, you only want to tie down cables that won't be moving, that none of them will be moving at all. So, Yeah, the one of the things that we do a lot when we're coming out of that type of connector is um, to, to, to basically... Um, um, put them into a sheath, you know, that so that it's going to all come out as one cable. Now, we'll still do exactly what Marty talked about, which is to tie it to something so it's not pulling on everything. Um, but but that is usually going in. And usually it's because we have some components that just don't pass through very well. I, I really like passing. I really like to have a breakout on the back. So I tend to be tend to lean towards that. But having it go, if, if we have to go in, um, just making sure that we, we have a um, for some reason, I'm, my, my, my mind is missing the word that is, that is for that, but a sheath that goes around it all. So, um, yeah. So next question. Talalik Lopez Waterman, currently residing in Pittsburgh, PA, asks, I really love the videos Johnny Harris does on his YouTube channel. He does some wonderful graphics that are a combination of digital and graphic. Do you think having that kind of team for a second hour would be appropriate? Good guy. After looking at a few of his videos, uh, I think that it, it, it's, he used to work for Vox, I believe it was. And so he's, he's really well versed in uh, creating graphics for uh, large audiences. Uh, this is his channel. If you haven't seen it, uh, let me see if I can find any of the graphics. But he does some amazing, like, yeah, look at this stuff. And it's him. It's not a team. It's, it's him. I've watched a, a few of his videos, and yeah, he, he's, he he's spent some serious time. It's like, look at that. NF in NFT. It's, it's really cool. So yeah, I would love to have him for a second hour. Some of his videos have gotten millions of views. Like this one, it's like a million views. to explain something I have avoided explaining for a very long time. Yeah, the uh, uh, SPF program that's now going to become an add-on for, um, or an add-in or whatever, uh, in Zoom uh, from Tuomo. Uh, is uh, probably something that could work for you. And we're working on having him come in first of the year to come in and do a second hour on it. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. I haven't seen any of Jonathan Harris's video other than the sample just shown there by Guy, but uh, it seems to me he would do all that in post-production. We're a live show. Uh, and doing it in a live show would be much more difficult because the questions come up, you know, right before we start uh, answering them. So I don't know if we'd have enough time to produce great graphics like that on the fly and get them on the air live. Yeah, it's um, it's something actually I'm, I've been talking to Hasmuk about, uh, you know, with his team and so on and so forth, that, that I think that uh, I think that those graphics are great for, as, as Courtney was pointing to, for post-production, um, doing something that is highly, uh, a lot of graphics for um, real time is extremely expensive and it takes a lot of people to do it. Um, now, I'm open to trying to do as much of that as we can, um, but typically that's not going to, it's, it's going to be very hard to do. Um, in, in, you know, cause that means we really have to, it's not just the, the graphics, it's the queuing, it's the timing, it's the rehearsal, it's the, you know, we do a lot of these kinds of things for other shows and it just becomes like it, it will make it make the show very heavy. Um, we could do it every once in a while, but I, I think that, I, I think that part of it is, is that I look at having, it's probably more of a Sunday discussion, but I look at having the second hour as being a discussion, you know, and I actually try to minimize as, <laughs> the presentation part of that as much as we can um, so that we get to discussion. When you're watching, if, if you're watching the, the the second hours, you'll notice that the that the discussion goes on much longer if there's not a lot of questions at the very beginning. <laughs> so at the very beginning, we kind of make a decision about how hard we're going to push this. If there's a lot of questions at the very beginning of a second hour, then there's then the discussion is very short. 
you know, and we try to get to questions really quickly because I think that discussion is important. I, th I love his channel and I think that what he's doing is great. And I think that we could apply everything that he's talking about to um, things that we put on our channel that explain, let's, let's, for instance, we're talking today about phase and polarity and how it affects this. I, all the things that we talk about today could probably be condensed down into a three or four minute piece that explains all of these things, uh, or even a two minute piece that explains all these concepts that we could either take what we did on a live discussion and make it that, or put that out first and then open up, a, you know, have the Q and A everyone that the, the, the short pithy, you know, dense graphics go into something that we post for every second hour a week before that second hour, you know, so that you can look at it. Here's some other places to look. So everyone gets on the same page and it'll make the conversation even more rich than what it had. But I think that that's, that makes it a little easier for us to manage. But I, I think what he's doing is great. And, um, you know, one of my favorite opens that's similar, if you want to look at how much information you can absorb at one time is the, is the uh, opening credits for the, the kingdom. And we're not going to play it here, but, but you can, uh, but you can go look for it on YouTube. You get an, a really rich history course in like a minute <laughs> or two or two, or, you know, like it, it just, it's, it's incredible. So um, to me, that's kind of the, the high watermark there. And I hope we can do more of that next year. Next question. From John Foltz in Ceilings Grove, Pennsylvania. John asks, what does the panel think of the DJI RS3 ecosystem for gimbals? I think it's the state of the art. Like I think that the, the right now the RS3s for, for that price point is the state of the art. Um, I've gotten to play with them a little bit. I didn't get to do very much with it. I only had it for an afternoon, um, but uh, it is impressive. You know, so you have the RS3 for people listening is a gimbal system. It's the newest gimbal system for DSLRs or that kind of, I think it's like 12 kilograms is the max weight on it. Um, so, you know, a little less than six pounds. Um, and uh, is that right? Anyway, um, so the, uh, the, it, it is um, basically you have a gimbal, you can have a remote person managing focus. I think you can have even Zoom is another controller, but I, I know you can do focus. It has a LiDAR system that you can you can calibrate for it so that, you know, you can see what your, fo you know, you can manage the focus to it. Um, you can, the wireless control can go for miles. <laughs> so you can be in a follow car doing focus on, a, on something that's attached. It's got, a, it's very, very modular. And I think that if you bought everything that they make for it, it'd be less than five grand. And um, and it and it's and then you'd have a very complete system. I think that I think the RS three is probably if you uh, it's just short of like once you if you max out what it's doing, I think you're hiring a steady cam operator after that. <laughs> like you know, like you, if if you can't do it with that, I think then you're going to start. You know, you, you need you need a professional with a big rig to to ma to match what it's doing. It's really impressive. Next question. Next one in from Douglas Carmichael. In this video where Greg Wells discusses the greatest showman theme, there's a link to it, he uses UAD plugins, even with a Waves endorsement and a plug line of his own. How are endorsements typically structured in our industry? Go ahead, Mitchell. Uh, we like to call it moolah, long green, cash. Um, a lot of the higher end people get uh, financial rewards for it. Uh, typical people like you and me, we might get a free plugin in order to... Uh, pitch it. But uh, as far as I know, I'm not getting any of those endorsements. Uh, go ahead, Nigel. Uh, two quick things. One, uh, if you see it, they probably paid for it. And second of all, I've been about in about three home theater, high-end home theaters recently, and they've all used the opening sequence of The Greatest Showman to demonstrate the sound system. So must wow. have done something right. I, now I know. Now I have to go back and watch the opening again. I, I haven't really thought through that um, for a while. I mean, it's a good... I, my, people will tell you that I am not a musical person. Like, I'm always like, these musicals will be great if everyone stops singing. So, I, you know, that's kind of my, my approach to musicals. <laughs> but I have to say, I really enjoyed Greatest Showman. <laughs> like, it was, my daughter was obsessed with it, you know, and, and I, and I, um, and I admit that I thought that Hamilton was pretty good too. So those are the two that stand out. But outside of that, I don't watch any of them. But uh, I'll have to, I'll have to def definitely take a look at that. As far as the sponsorships go, um, the, the big thing there is that, the best sponsors, the ones that really understand the market will sponsor you and let you say whatever you're going to say. Um, those are the ones that you, those are the partners that you want are the ones that'll, that'll set the, the influencer free. They're giving the money to talk knowing that generally they like their products, but if they push back, if they push back a little bit, it makes them much more, more much more uh, believable and much more authentic. 
and their and and the listen the viewers will be much more likely to take their word for like hey this is good or bad or even if they push back on a sponsor that that paid for it um, those are the smartest sponsors they're not all that way but the smartest ones will say we're just giving you money because we want you to keep doing what we do and when we show up on it we're, we know we're going to benefit from it um, those are the ones that really understand un understand how to build a relationship with the community next question Josh Kaufman Pittsburgh PA asked what is dynamic about a dynamic mic? Does the name derive from its usage or operation? Um, uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Jeff. A dynamic mic uh, generates electricity from the motion of the diaphragm. So it is an electrical generator and a dynamo is an old term for an electrical generator. So that microphone requires no external power. It generates sound, uh, generates electricity simply from the sound moving the diaphragm. And it is a coil of wire in a magnetic field. I go ahead, uh, Marty. Yeah, what, uh, Jeff got it exactly right, and you can think of a you know, dynamic microphone. Uh, very, it's very close to the um, inverse of a loudspeaker, where the electrical impulse moves the cone. In a microphone, the audio energy moves a diaphragm that then moves the coil behind it. Um, as opposed to a condenser mic, which uses a completely different principle to transduce uh, acoustic energy into electric energy. Good, Javier. Nothing to add, those were two perfect uh, answers. <laughs> Good, Courtney. Exactly, Jeff nailed it. Dynamo is where the, the dynamic comes from. And, uh, and a speaker is actually a motor because it's being driven by the electrical signal in the magnetic field. Go ahead, Ken. And if you wonder how all this stuff can possibly be, the ear in-ear monitors that you're using are the same concept as a dynamic mic is using in reverse. And so you'll discover, if you want to play around with this, that you can hear through your microphone and you can talk into your earphones, although nobody wants to do that except to prove the point. Dynamic means it's moving. Next question. Roscoe Jones and in Madison, Indiana, ask, in a large open room half full with an audience, there's a link to it, what microphones would you use for a brass quintet, and where would you place them? Hanging them is not an option. Go ahead, Jeff. So I don't know if someone can call up the picture, but it's a, uh, it's a church, and I assume the brass quintet is going to be up on the raised area. So where you would want the microphones is distant from them. That's how we're used to hearing brass. They want to hear the sound of the room. So personally, I would use a uh, pair of omnidirectional microphones spaced, you know, 20 to 24 inches apart, depending on how far away we are, and on a tall stand. So maybe 10 feet and with the raised uh, steps, I'd probably want to be 10 feet above that. So a 12 foot stand. So often that's a lighting stand used as a microphone stand. And as you uh, pro probably have noticed that we have a, a very, very good audio team here today to answer your questions. And we're cutting through these questions really fast. So um, if you've got audio questions or any questions at all about media, you can go ahead and throw them in or we'll start the second hour a little early. Uh, go ahead, Marty. Um. You, you didn't say, Roscoe, whether uh, you're, this is for recording purposes. Oh, but you did say it's that there's a half half full audience in the room. So, um, yeah. So Jeff uh, Jeff had some good advice. Um, although I would be a little concerned with using omnidirectional microphones because it'll pick up a lot of um, uh, crowd noise. So anybody moving around in the pews, like creaking chairs and stuff like that will be picked up as well. So you might want to, you might want to consider, um, cardioid microphones in a stereo array, uh, either spaced or you could do an X, Y, uh, crossed configuration, um, has a bit of a different effect, but a nice stereo spread. And, uh, uh go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, as for the type of microphones, you know, brass, there are low frequency brasses and high frequency brasses. And so you want to find something that will, um, accommodate both, um, uh, ribbon microphones, uh, I've seen used, uh, quite a bit for brass because they have a, a bit of a high frequency roll off. And so they don't sound as harsh, uh, especially if you're going to close mic, uh, a brass instrument. Go ahead, Jeff. 
Yeah, I like that Marty brought up the uh, the possibility of using uh, some near coincident or uh, coincident rays. Generally, something coincident. You know, Marty brought up a rhythm. Can you define you coincident pair, for the for the listeners? Uh, sorry, yes, coincident means the two microphones are at the same point in space. So that's the X Y and the M S techniques. And X Y is a directional mic pointing left to the left channel and a directional mic pointing right to the right channel. So crossed cardioids or crossed bidirectionals. If you take two figure eight bidirectional microphones with 90 degrees between them, so one's pointing 45 degrees to the left, the other 45 degrees to the right, that's uh, Bloom Line, named after uh, Alan Dower Bloom Line, um, who is sort of our uh, grandfather of all stereo. And uh, ribbon mics would be great for that because ribbon mics, most ribbon mics are a figure eight pattern. Um, that generally works if the acoustic is a great sounding acoustic. If the room is less than ideal, then some space between your microphones, either a near coincident or a space technique um, would work a little better. What's the difference between near coincident and spaced? Well, near coincident is sort of a foot or less space between the microphones. And so you need to also use some directional microphones so you get some amplitude difference. So you have cardioid microphones pointing off to the sides. Once you get beyond 12 or 15 inches of spacing, then you can get all of your stereo simply from the spacing. And then you can use omnidirectional microphones. So they won't have an amplitude difference because they don't have a directional pattern. Go ahead, Marty. Okay, Jeff. <clears throat> so um, when you use near, near spaced microphones with a quintet, so you've got people spaced around them, are you going to have any phasing issues? The near coincident is designed to have very little time difference between the two mics because it's kept near coincident, close together. So they're a foot apart. So the most amount of time difference you would have is if someone is directly off to the side of the array and sound goes about uh, a foot every millisecond. So the biggest time delay is you're going to have a millisecond. Now, probably you're going to be uh, towards the audience from this group. So you're going to be stepping back from it with the mic. So nobody's going to be at 90 degrees to the side of the array. They might be, you know, 40 or 50 degrees off to the left. So the actual time difference is less than a millisecond. And because we're using directional microphones pointed out, when it's someone is off to the left, they're louder in the left mic than they are in the right mic because the right mic is pointed away from them. So that helps with any kind of phase issues we might have. When do we get phase issues? When we get the same sound source, the trumpet player sitting off to the left, arriving at two microphones at different times. And since they're not in the same place, they're arriving at different times. And what's um, the, what's the, when do you start worrying about that as far as how many milliseconds difference? Any, or uh, is it five milliseconds or one millisecond or? One millisecond is, is we're going to hear comb filtering from phasing. And that's why it's important that when you get to those kind of time delays, you get the, the difference between the two microphones in amplitude because one mic is pointed towards the left side of the group. The other mic is pointed towards the right side of the group and those microphones are directional. So where you get large time differences, you also get bigger amplitude differences. And therefore the, if there's no, if the later sound is quieter, then there's less phase problems. Obviously if the later sound was completely turned off, there would be no phase problem. And if we think about it, you know, in time, uh, we often think it's not quite even, but we, you know, a rough, a rough tool to think about that is, is about a millisecond every foot, right? So they have to be you know, if they're sitting right on top of each other, they should be getting them very, you know, if, at a fraction of a, of a millisecond. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Rule of thumb is, is, is a foot per millisecond. That's a great one. And again, nobody's off to the side, completely to the side of the array. So they're not at this extreme 90 degree angle where the distance between the mics is the delay you get. If they're 20, 30 degrees off, that delay is going to be much shorter than one millisecond. Right. Now, if you move to spaced omnidirectional microphones, the spacing gets larger, which gets you a bigger time delay. And you no longer have that advantage of the microphones being directional, so you're not getting an amplitude difference. So that's definitely a place where we have to worry about uh, phase problems. 
Now, when do you, you only hear this when this gets summed to mono. When you listen in stereo, you get beautiful stereo. And these, the only time you, they never get mixed together because the left microphone is coming out of the left speaker or the left headphone. The right microphone is coming out of the right speaker or the right headphone. So they're not actually combined and well, you don't get the comb filtering phase issue, but we always have to worry about mono. And that's a, that points to, you know, one of the most important things that I, when I first got, started getting into surround, of really understanding that that the time is really the thing. You know, like we're, you know, the timing between the ears is really what is how we decide where things are, at least around us, not maybe above us, but but around us. Go ahead, Marty. So the, the uh, interference that Jeff is referring to is also frequency dependent. So you'll get different kinds of interference between the two mics. And by interference, I mean when a sound arrives at a microphone or two mic when a sound arrives at two microphones at different times and then gets some to mono you get an interference and we'll look actually look at that in the second hour i'll be able to demonstrate that um, but it's also frequency dependent so um there's that to consider yeah i it yeah for some reason i really want to do now i for some reason this discussion makes me really want to take an ambio mic like into a like a cathedral and have someone do a chant because I, I realized just how much you can you know you can hear different like really feel like you're in the middle of something using using that as an advantage anyway soon <laughs> next question from paul terry wallace in austin texas asking how do you overcome fear of trying new things out in after hours uh, go ahead mitchell well it's an interesting question but uh in most cases uh most of the jobs i've gotten here alex has tossed it to me within a few seconds of showtime. So uh, the answer to that question is, don't think about it. Uh, you don't have time to think about it. You get a chance to uh, just get the uh, uh, the gist of what you have to do, and you do it. So uh, that that works wonders. I mm -hmm. mean, most things yep. that, that I'm fearful of, I dread. Yep. Uh, go ahead, Ken. Well, there's two things here. We're talking about uh, trying new new things in after hours, and then we're talking about a fear. And as I as I read this and and pondered it a little bit, uh, something came to mind. And so, pardon me if I if I prattle for a little bit. But trying new things is what after hours is is about as as much as anything else. It is the experimenter's playground. It's where we go to try new things. We, if we're going to fail, we'd rather fail there than anywhere else, I suppose. The issue that I, that I enjoy about that is there's, there's not a lot of mean criticism there. And this goes to the way we respond to people who do try new things out. Mm -hmm. It might be, uh, an issue that, that there's a, not a fear of purchasing stuff. I mean, that's what we do here. The sound you often hear is the opening of wallets around mm -hmm. here <laughs> to buy new things, yeah. but it's the way we can, communicate our response to the questions that are asked. And we could perhaps be a lot more kinder and gentler in after hours when someone brings a new yep. piece of gear up and says, well, how do you think, what do you think about this? Yep. Now go ahead, Tom. Generally after hours is a safe place. However, you should fear uttering the word Bluetooth. Should Mickey hear you say that a thrashing will commence. <laughs> there you go. Uh, next question. John Foltz, Ceilings Grove, PA, asked, where could I find the most important audio topics to include in an intro course on audio production for college students? Now go ahead, Jeff. Right here, every Wednesday. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. I go ahead, Marty. I would stick with the basics. Uh, if you're teaching audio production, college students are going to want to know about mixers and microphones and, you know, intermediate stuff, but they really need to understand the basics of frequency and electrical uh, and voltage transmission, uh, you know, how a microphone works, how a loudspeaker works, what happens inside of a mixer. You want to make it fun, but they but you, they got to understand the basics. Go ahead, Courtney. And don't forget acoustics, because the way sound interacts with its environment is a large portion of, of how you capture sound and how you play back sound uh, and listen to sound. So don't forget acoustics and acoustical treatment as part of that course. Yeah, I would say that if you go to the YouTube channel Audio University, which is pretty, pretty cool, um, 
watch those videos. I kind of feel like I, it's not that I agree with everything that's in that YouTube channel. And I'd love to hear what Marty and Jeff and some of the other folks think of it, but, and Courtney, um, but if you watch that channel, it gets us on the same page on many, many, many concepts, you know, and then ask questions to fill that in here on Wednesday mornings um, and or Wednesday afternoons or evenings, depending on where you are in the world. Um, but but ask questions here and buy a few mics and go out and record lots of things. <laughs> you know, like there's there is something about, you know, you can um, you, you can have theoretical knowledge, but you seem to need to go do it. And if you have a dynamic mic and some kind of shotgun mic and a, you know, and a couple other mics and you just record lots of things and, and try to work them out, especially if you can do something like work on a podcast or, or help other people do recordings or do something that keeps you in action while watching, you know, channels like that while asking questions among us. I think that you would learn a lot very, very fast, probably faster than most schools. Um, next question. Next one in from Paul Terry Wallace in Austin, Texas. If you're sending video and audio from multiple iPhones without cables to Zoom on a Mac Mini, what are your options to send audio to Zoom? Not only uh, not using anything rogue Amoeba. Go ahead, guy. I'd say you're probably going to have to use some kind of app like a, a Mimo Live and use uh, NDI camera on the phones to be able to shoot the video and the audio over. Otherwise, you're just going to be bringing in separate instances, so separate accounts. So uh, one 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 phone to one user and pushing it in. But then every time that that microphone goes hot, it's going to switch the video over to that unless you spotlight or pin that um, little spotlight for uh, a meeting. So it just depends on what you're trying to do. But yeah, I'd say you're going to have to get some kind of software like Switcher Studio, Cinemaker, Mimo Live, something to be able to slice and dice and keep that audio mixed in there. Yeah, 100%. 100%. I was thinking Mimo Live myself, but yeah, I think that I think you're right. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael is here with a question. The Chicago Air and Water Show utilized Zoom for distributing live audio description to blind and low vision audiences. Wouldn't an assistive listening app like Sennheiser Mobile Connect be more accessible to that population than a video-first platform? I go ahead, Marty. Well, if we're talking about uh, visually impaired people, um, chances are that you know they're, if, if they're not also hearing impaired, they can hear just fine. Uh, so a hearing assistance system, while also very important in, in, a, in a venue for people who are hearing impaired, uh, isn't much isn't much value to vision impaired people. So uh, Zoom is a is a convenient, inexpensive, um, and effective way to provide captioning and text information for people who um, need that, and and a, and a closer screen if they're like back in the room. Go ahead, Harshid. I would say anything that makes any type of median easiest to get to is going to be your best bet. So in this case, if we're going to use Zoom, Zoom is really easily achievable. You put it on your phone and you have that audio stream of any sort. So if we're going to call it audio description, closed captioning, if we add that to any stream, it's going to be a, a benefit to the end user. Uh, there is Spectrum did buy out a app from the American Council of the Blind, a couple of gentlemen that made a app where you take it to the theater and you point the video at the at the theater screen and it syncs the audio to audio description but it's the drawback i find still and you could still use it anybody could download it on ios or android spectrum access is that it works well but it's not enough media it's not enough things that i want to watch it feels like it's maybe just everything on paramount and not enough stuff of abc or nbc or etc but uh if, in these cases yes it would be easy to have it on any app you don't necessarily need to have zoom for that so um I agree if you're trying to use uh, the Sennheiser uh, device that you mentioned about or the app, but uh, mainly it's ease of access. If you could mesh it into YouTube, then so be it. If you could mesh it into Zoom, so be it. Yeah, go ahead, Marty. So it also occurred to me that audio description, which is what he's asking, uh, Douglas is asking about, is is a um, a method where human beings are audibly describing what is happening on the stage. And so, yes, that is an audio 
product that people will listen to and um, assistive listening, uh, you know, which is a way to deliver audio to people who um, are wearing hearing aids or uh, headphones with receivers, uh, listening to a special channel, uh, is a very effective way to, to provide that audio description uh, to people, yes. But I think uh, also, it can also work on Zoom. I think that the, the one of the assumptions also is that a lot of people have Zoom, and you if you do something like Sennheiser Mobile Connect, you now have to get everybody online with that. You know, you know, you have a lot of people that you have to now teach how to use a new product as opposed to the product that everybody's using. So I think that might be part of the calculation as well. And I bet you that Zoom is probably less expensive than Sennheiser uh, Mobile Connect. Um, next question. From David Brady in New York, New York. David has trying to help our Tyco group recording events and rehearsals, specking out a Tascam DR70D, and torn between these mics, a matched pair of AT4041s, or a single AT8022. Any guidance? Uh, P.S. Tycos are big drums. Just saying. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. So the AT8022 is a is an XY. So it's a stereo microphone. Has two elements within it. So if you are inexperienced, or you need to set up quickly, or you need it to be visually small, that's a great option. So sometimes for rehearsals, that's a great thing. But I would always pick to have two separate mics because I can always put them in a crossed coincident XY configuration, but I could also use them in a near coincident configuration. Using the two AT4041s gives you that option. If you get the single stereo mic, you can never separate the two. Go ahead, Mitchell. I'm making an assumption here, but it, it, the Tyco is going to move a lot of air. So wouldn't uh, the same mics you use to record a bass drum be appropriate for something like that inside the uh, the cavity or next to it? Jeff, your thoughts on I'm that? Assuming this is a Tyco group. So again, probably they want to capture the sound of the group in the rehearsal. So mm -hmm. probably more distant than a close miking of a single drum. Go ahead, Marty. So interesting. Uh, yes, those are all good suggestions. Um, something that uh, worked out remarkably well for me and was I was completely taken by surprise is using boundary mics. Um, put them, putting them, take, take, take two of them, put them on the floor at some distance that will be um, capture the entire ensemble and you will get some great sound. You want to be sure to get... Uh, a boundary mic that has good low-end response because a lot of them are tailored for speech. Uh, the one I used was from Sankin. Interesting. Uh, next question. Chris Widener from Lafayette, Indiana asks, Alex, you mentioned other higher-end mixers with multiple digital output buses for submix. I'm more used to having multiple analog outputs than converting to digital. Any recommendations than a 16 by 24 channel setup? An uh, X32 with Dante card. <laughs> like that's that'll that'll do it you know then then you have lots of outs and lots of ins and you have analog in analog out you have uh but i mean to, to solve the problem there's many mixers that will do that but to solve that problem it's probably the least expensive way um for that many channels i'd probably say and I, I don't I, since no one's raising their hand i'm, I, I'm assuming that people agree <laughs> x32 with with a dante card would would do it uh next question James Vosling in Minneapolis, Minnesota asked, when you have trained your ears to hear problems in audio, is it harder to just enjoy listening to audio for enjoyment? Go ahead, Javier. I don't think it's hard. Well, it's harder to overlook bad audio. Like with everything that you get more experience, uh, you start to, to have something to compare it. For example, when you're little, you can tell if something is too sweet or too spicy, depending on if your house, they cook with too much spice or too much sugar. And then as long as you start trying new things and learning about new foods, you start like learning the nuances of different foods. So I think audio and video is the same. When you start to have more knowledge and, and hear and see different things, you can overlook bad things, but you can also, you can concentrate and see, and in this case, uh, hear better, like good things. So I think you you will enjoy good mixes more and you just have to turn a blind eye to bad mixes. Good, Marty. It can be really difficult for me to go into a bar or a club or something where there's a, you know, a band playing and where there's a a terrible mix or, or something's not working right, it can be really difficult for me to enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, uh, Mitchell. Yeah, plus one on everything everybody just said. Um, 
Intermodulation distortion was something I had to teach myself to hear. Um, sometimes there's a distortion. You just have to know what to be listening for. And then once you know it and once you understand it, um, then it will ruin the, uh, the experience if it's a bad problem on, you know, trying to enjoy it too. Yeah. Courtney. When I was working as a production sound mixer and listening critically to, uh, sound all day long, people would ask me, well, what kind of stereo do you have at home? You must have a great stereo setup." And I went, no, I don't like to listen to any music at home after listening to sound critically all day. I just kind of want to turn off my brain and and not listen critically. So I don't have a high end audio system at home uh, because I don't want to listen critically at home because it would bother me listening to all the uh, defects that I hear. There you go, Jeff. So much like Mitchell, uh, hearing uh, MP3s and the data compression of poor MP3s and MP4s, boy, I can't can't listen to those. Thankfully, most of the uh, that is getting much better. But as far as listening to music, uh, if it's good music, then I can enjoy it regardless of the audio quality up to a certain point. You know, of course, you want the best audio quality with the best music, but I'd rather listen to good music with terrible audio quality than vice versa. Yeah, and Javier? And just adding, uh, when you go to a bar or a movie or something with uh, your spouse or your friend or something that they are not uh, into this business, I try to don't, uh, don't point errors at them. I, when something is good, I, I try to point them out because if not, you're actually ruining it for them because they won't be able to turn it off the next time they're in a bad calibrated theater or something. Yeah, I, I agree with you. The um, I, I call that oftentimes the red pill, uh, you know, the, the red pill conversation. And I'll say, you know, this is a red pill conversation. That means you can walk away if you don't want to hear this, because once I say it, you'll never be able to unsee it or unhear it. And um, I, I've i learned to pr try to protect my family from <laughs> the level of, of stuff that I look at. I mean, because for me, it's not just the audio. It's anything that I've ever worked on in detail, you know, I'm picky about. And so... I'll sit there and just go, I can't believe they put that in that script. <laughs> I can't believe he just said that, or I can't believe this. I don't like the computer graphics. Like I, I watched, uh, I took my, my family to uh, Black Panther and, you know, I used to, we were talking about the fact that I used to fly the queen ship a lot, you know, for a year and a half, I flew a spaceship, you know, on, on computer, in computer graphics and the weight, um, this is a red pill conversation. Sorry, I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, the, the weight that they apply to the ships in Black Panther make me crazy. Like just make me completely crazy because they don't have enough weight. Um, so everything moves way too fast. And, and so it, it, it is, it makes them all feel like toys instead of like big beasts of, of ships. And it's, and, um, it drives me crazy. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, it's hard, it's hard for me to watch the, the movie. Uh, anyway, go ahead, Jeff. Uh, here's my red pill that I'm going to put out and you can notice is that every time a character in a movie or television show steps up to a lectern, the sound person puts in a little sound effect of feedback. Yeah. <laughs> you're right. As soon as you started saying that, I was like, oh, they always put the little feedback in to tell you that you're that they're walking up to it. Yeah, that's a very classic one. And then the other one is the... I was just in a, a, there was a discussion on in a Discord that I'm in, a, a long discussion on how upset sound designers are about the Wilhelm scream. Like you don't have to put it into every movie. <laughs> so, but, but some sound designers believe that you should put it into every movie. Like it, there should be, it's, it's like a little, like a little uh, signature. Uh, ben Burt likes to put it into every movie. I think, I think everything he's ever worked on has the Wilhelm scream in it. Um, and then other, and he's got more Academy Awards than everybody else. So I, I feel like he can be, he can do whatever he wants, but, um, but other sound designers, it drives them crazy. So if you don't know Maybe. what the Wilhelm scream is, you can, you can search it on YouTube and you'll get a whole collection. And then Maybe they can design, disguise it as feedback when they come up to the microphone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but, but Jeff's totally right. This is, this is like, we're going to, this is kind of like a, yeah, we're going to lean back into it. We should do a whole second hour on, we should do a whole second hour and warn everybody ahead of time and just call it the red pill. Like the red pill second hour where we just tell you all the things that you're not seeing that drive us crazy. Um, but then the people know not to listen to it if they, if they, uh, if they don't want to know. All right, next question. From Chris Reidner in Lafayette, Indiana. Chris asked if you were designing a kitchen set from scratch with two ovens and glass top burners, what would you suggest for keeping reflectivity down on the glass surfaces and not showing up grease from, say, Scrapple or Spam frying? Scrapple. So good. Anyway, <laughs> that guy. 
yeah, I would say to try and get some kind of surface similar and run some tests now before you actually commit to buying whatever that surface is and set up a camera where that's going to be. Um, if it was already in there, I would say you get big soft lights. Um, if you can use some kind of silks and that will hide a lot of, uh, the, the, when you're using a hard light, it's really easy to see those kind of things because it will re the, reflect more so uh, the other thing that you can do is toss a circular polarizer on the lens and start to rotate it and see if that helps with some of those uh, glares and reflections and then just camera angles i mean trying to move the camera around because it, it's like a you know it's just angles so you're just trying to get different angles but then also um, try to uh, get wide shots and close-ups to where you're cutting out those surfaces and just go right in on the food a uh, wide shot if you see something you don't like and then the medium shots just again try to talk to your camera operator and move map uh, if it's you then use a ptz and get that shot that you want where you avoid those uh those things that you don't want to see mitchell um i can't imagine any cooking show involving scrabble and spam first of all but uh as far as the surfaces go i mean there are other alternatives to glass burners i mean bosch makes specific surfaces that uh, don't show up fingerprints and things like that so if you start out with something that's uh, uh, less likely to show uh, marks on it, you're going to have a lot easier time of reducing it. Here you go, Courtney. Yeah, as Guy was saying, remember, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. So if horizontal glass surfaces are in the set, just don't have any lights that are at the same height as your camera and opposite your camera, and you'll avoid all reflections. So move them higher, move them further forward so that they're out of the incidence of reflection. I would be tempted to build a cover that was, and I'm, I'm making this up, so I don't know if it would, but be tempted to build a cover that was uh, use inductance as opposed to, a, you know, a um, he, some kind of heated burner, but I would use inductance and then I would have something that isn't going to take that inductance and I would put it as a cover that's anodized or, or something that, that is kind of very matte and set it on top of around the burner. So the burners would still be glass but all the area around it would be kind of some kind of mat. It's a very interesting problem. And um, if you're making Scrapple, just, I, I expect to get something. That's all I'm saying. I love Scrapple. It's like it's like haggis for East Coasters. Anyway, next well question. done and very crispy. Yes, yes. Uh, next question. Elliot Robinson from Las Vegas. Where can I find a guide to audio best practices? Uh, go ahead, Marty. Well, I mean, aside from Wednesdays here on Office Hours <laughs> and after hours, the other 22 hours every day, um, I would uh, look for your local chapter of the Audio Engineering Society and go to their meetings, join the, uh, join the society. It's an excellent source of information about best practices for audio and up-and-coming trends and things like that. There are um, a number of good publications out there um, on audio for recording, for live audio, for stage, etc. There are a number of uh, people associated with Office Hours who do uh, their own webcasts, uh, Zoom shows. Uh, 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 Brian Maddox is one. Um, uh, I do one as well. And uh, there are... Um, some others, I believe. Don't, Jeff, don't you do something? Yeah, the um, the what I would what I'd say is that I, again, the one that I've been kind of reflexively sending people to at this point is Audio University on YouTube. Of just just watch all these, and then we can have another conversation about it. And again, there's a couple nitpicking things that I watch, and I go, eh, I don't know if I agree with that. But overall, I think the amount of breadth and depth that Audio University on on YouTube is providing is pretty pretty impressive. Go ahead, Courtney. And if you're talking about production audio, uh, Curtis Judd's uh, YouTube channel is always good for analysis of new equipment and comparison uh, between equipment and production equipment and how it works in the industry. So, yeah, thumbs absolutely. up for him. Uh, next question. Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, PA, asks, in addition to the left-right channel timing, how does binaural audio direct the spatial perception for the listener? And go ahead, Jeff. So Josh mentioned uh, interoral, between the ears, time of arrival delay. Then there's also uh, something that we call head shadowing, which are frequency differences. So when sound goes off to the side of your head, your head blocks sound to your far ear, and that will reduce high frequencies. Uh, so it's an acoustic shadow. And then the fleshy part on the side of your ear called the pinna, 
causes reflections, that cause very, very uh, short delays that do actually cause comb filtering that we do not consciously perceive, but goes into our uh, direction sensing mechanism, our localization mechanism. And that's the primary thing that gives us localization in the vertical domain because the ears are on the side of our head. We're really good at hearing uh, horizontally <clears throat> localization, but not so good uh, vertically. And the pinna is instrumental in that. And it also helps to t us determine front from back. It's interesting. Um, I, I thought it was crazy when I first saw people building heads. They, they, they have literally heads with um, latex ears and they put the mics into those. And I thought it was nuts until I learned a little bit more about what Jeff was talking about. It's a really fascinating uh, problem. Go ahead, Courtney, real quick. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, the head creates the shadow, which in binaural recording, that's two microphones placed exactly where your ears would be with a head in between it. Yeah, there you go, Jeff. So the term that kind of lumps all this together is an HRTF, a head-related transfer function. And that's using math to recreate what happens in your head and your brain every day. Uh, last question for the first hour. Graham Codwell in Belfast, Northern Ireland says, I'm running an animated background graphics at an event from an ATEM 1ME production studio 4K. Is there any benefit to making an animation in the media pool rather than just running it as a video from an external source machine? Good guy. Yeah, the nice thing is you won't have to worry about that other machine failing, but there is a limitation and that's uh, the number of frames you can store. So depending on the resolution, you're gonna be at uh, for Ultra HD, the 4K, you're gonna have 180 frames. So that's like what, six seconds. So uh, that's not a whole lot to go with, and you only have two media players. So just be be aware that uh, once you store those in there, you, you're you're pretty limited. So if you have a hyperdeck or something else um, that you can feed in there, play out B, um, then you can go that route. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Agree with Guy. I think he's spot on. Um, I use the shuttle hyperdeck because it has the ability to queue a little bit easier, so I can find my in and out points uh, pretty quickly. Uh, play out B, source another uh, option for you. Absolutely. All right. We are jumping into our second hour and talking about um, phase and polarity. Um, and I'm going to let, be, as we as we get into it, uh, if you have questions about this, this is something that most people don't have their head completely around. And we're going to try to get our heads a little bit further around um, as we go through this. And I think I'm going to let Marty just kick it off. But if you have questions, go ahead and start throwing them in here um, uh, around this so that we can fully uh, flesh this out <laughs> and understand uh, what what phase and polarity are. Go ahead, Marty. All right, so let's get into this. And I'm just going to dive in rather than talk about it. Mm -hmm. So um, let's look at something simple like uh, this is an Irish drum called a boudron or, or bowron. And it's a si simple single head drum with an open back. And um, you hit it with a beater on one side. <clears throat> now, when you do that, uh, at the moment that the beater hits the skin, it creates a positive pressure wave on the back side of the skin. So the skin is actually pushing audio, uh, pushing air, right? And so uh, this will create a, if you put a microphone on there, it will create um, a positive voltage on the output of the microphone. So let me just say that again. The beater hits the skin, the skin pushes air, and when that air hits the diaphragm of the microphone and pushes that diaphragm in, that produces a positive voltage output, okay, at that moment. Now, the skin will come back and go in and go out, and that's how you get this cyclical uh, sine wave. Um, conversely, on the beater side of the head, because the skin is moving in the in inward, it will create a negative air pressure on the beater side of the head. And so if you put a microphone there, it will actually pull the diaphragm of the microphone out and create a negative pressure or a negative voltage on the output of the microphone at that moment. So polarity, is the difference between a positive voltage or a negative voltage, okay? Or a positive pressure wave or a negative pressure wave. 
Um, and <clears throat> now let's go back to the other side and put a microphone relatively close to that drum. And when you hit the drum, it produces that positive voltage. Now, the sine wave that I've shown here is a 100 hertz sine wave, and this is one microphone. If we put another microphone at one foot away, we will have two sine waves, and the second one will be slightly delayed from the first one because of the physical distance. So at one foot, we're talking about one millisecond. And so if we look at both of these on a oscilloscope, you'll see those two waves. Now let's move that microphone another foot away, two feet away, about two millisecond delay. Now you'll see the two sine waves, they're, they're further apart. If we go three, milli, three feet, three milliseconds, even further apart, and four. Now, here's something interesting. At five milliseconds, now this is at 100 cycles, at 100 hertz, you'll see that the two sine waves are in opposite polarity. When you sum those to mono, they will disappear because they are out of phase with each other. So the difference between polarity and phase, polarity is a single channel, and whether it is going positive or negative. But phase is a timing relationship between two channels or two audio paths, because it could be, as this is, one channel into two microphones, but it could also be two loudspeakers to a single person listening. If you are closer to one speaker than you are to another speaker, you could have the same effect, right? Um, <clears throat> you could also have a phasing difference or, or issue with a single microphone if you have a bounce off of a floor. So if you have somebody speaking into a microphone at a distance or an instrument at a distance, you'll have uh, an audio path that goes directly from the sound source to the microphone, and then you'll have a second audio path that bounces off of the floor and then goes to the microphone. It's a long, longer distance, and so you'll have a timing relationship. Now, um, that is, in a nutshell, the difference between polarity and phase. Go ahead, Jeff. So we're dealing with cyclical waveforms and phase to me is it's a way to express a portion of a cycle. So a circle has 360 degrees. So we do phase in degrees. 180 degrees is half of a cycle. 90 degrees is a quarter of a cycle. So much like you have the cyclical moon that goes through its phases from a full moon to waxing to a new moon to waning. And I'm sure I've got waxing and waning backwards. Who can remember that? But we all are, are used to the moon going through its phases. Its phase is a mathematician's way to express a fraction of a cycle and a fraction, some amount of portion of a cycle. And they never need to actually say what frequency it is. So there's a, there's a waveform with a bunch of different times on it. And it doesn't matter if it's a sine wave or it's a complex wave, it still has portions of cycles as long as it's periodic. And you can have multiple portions. So you can have th 360, you can have 720, that's two cycles. And if you have a relationship between two waves, what Marty's talking about, we can say that one wave lags behind another wave by a certain amount. So here, this has a 90 degree lag. The second waveform starts one quarter of a cycle after the first waveform. And the confusion comes in when we have this, because we're not sure, is that a half a cycle late or is that just upside down? So polarity is either positive or negative. We have bipolar waveforms. They go positive, negative all the time. And we can also flip them upside down. So the key thing to remember when you talk about or when one talks about polarity or phase, if it's a binary issue, meaning 
it is an either or, it is a switch, then you're talking about polarity. If it's much more complex than that, you're talking about phase. And phase is always interacting with time, whether that's sound moving in the air or that's some kind of time delay in a, in a system. Yeah, and one of the things that's really important, it's really important to understand this. Um, one of the things that, that I had happen at, a, at, a, at an event was just, just put this in perspective of like a practical <laughs> uh, issue with this is that it turned out as they built the convenience panel on the back of the of the pa- of the um, for the audio engineer somebody this is polarity switch the two you know switch the the two, the two leads um, so there's a ground but then there's the two leads and they switch it so that inverted the polarity so that's not phase it's polarity and it inverted the polarity but it means that 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 one channel is now exact opposite of what it should be. When they were mixing it throughout the rehearsal, the um, the left channel was a little lower than the right channel. So they kept on not having it even. And so it sounded a little, and I just kept on saying, well, the volume's not quite right. And hey, can you fix the, the, the left channel? I can see it's a little lower. Didn't fix it until the morning of the event. <laughs> so then they finally fixed it. The reason that that's important is because they were, because the polarity was inverted. When the left channel was lower than the right channel, it made it lower because it was canceling it partially. When it was brought up to match the right channel, it was now when summed, when summed together, it perfectly canceled the right channel. <laughs> you know, um, you know when it was brought up to it, only for phones uh, that were summing. So if you're listening to it again, this gets it. This gets it. If you're listening to it on headphones, which is what we were doing. We're listening to stereo on our headphones, and it sounds a little, um, it sounded a little off, but it didn't. It sounded like, oh, we're, we're hearing the show, right? Um, but but anybody listening on a phone where it was summed couldn't hear it. You know, like literally, just that 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 polarity inverted it, couldn't hear the person talking, um, and so it was hard for us to DX during a, during the show because we were trying to figure out why, like we could hear it, we couldn't understand why someone else couldn't hear it, but it was because in that sum process. The two, the, the inverted polarity was canceling each other out, and it only canceled it out when they were equal volume. Because you can imagine one pulling the other one together. Anyway, go ahead, Marty. Yeah, so we we're saying that this affects, or mostly affects, when you combine uh, channels into into mono. Um, when it's in stereo, you hear in good stereo. But there, are any elements of your mix that are in the center will disappear. Um, if you are left and right is of opposite polarity or what we say out of phase. And it will sound like this, the mix is very, very wide and there's nothing in the center. And and sometimes that that is one process to um, create more more surround, for instance, is to invert the polarity of, of the, you bring the signal in, invert the polarity, It'll take the voice out. <laughs> like it'll, usually, the person's coming right down the center, and then you can take that that information and put it into surround speakers or move them around. Like if you're just trying to take something that you're only getting in mono or stereo and put it into wider a wider speaker array, um, you can sometimes use that to your advantage. Um, yeah, go ahead, Co- Courtney. Yeah, there is a lot of confusion because a lot of mixers uh, will have a um, a thing marked phase. Uh, which is a 180 degree phase switch, which is actually is reversing the polarity of your microphone uh, 180 degrees so that you can get your micro, make sure that you have microphones that are in phase if they're facing opposite directions or uh, you have other problems with it being wired wrong. There was a problem for years with T powered microphones because they had uh, uh, DC power being sent down the two balanced lines, the you know, positive line and the negative line were going down the two audio lines rather than both of them carrying the same voltage as it does in 48 volt uh, phantom. So if you had the polarity reversed, the microphone wouldn't work or you could blow up the microphone. Uh, and the polarity and the phase were then tied together and you had to separate them separately and had to reverse phase if you had a phase issue and a polarity issue. It was very complex. And uh, thankfully, those days are mostly gone except I still have a few T-powered mics. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, it's, this, it's this, uh, this phrase that we use so nonchalantly, out of phase, that really, and 180 degree phase, that really causes all of the confusion with this. So 
a polarity inversion, reversing the polarity, which happens in what Courtney was saying in a button, in a, in a DAW, it can happen if we miswire our XLR cables. That is a complete uh, inversion. All your positives become negatives, your negatives become positives. The waveform gets flipped upside down. Nothing is happening with time or phase in that situation. Nothing is moving in time. Um, and if it's a standard pop tune stereo mix where we have left and right, but most of the lead vocal and the kick drum and the bass are all pan center. So they're equally in the left and the right. And we invert the right and we add them together. Well, all of that stuff is going to get canceled out, but we've done nothing with time. So we haven't actually adjusted phase. That's just polarity. Now, every manufacturer under the sun uses the absolute wrong symbol for the polarity button. They use the phase symbol. That's zero the, the slash through it. And that's part of the confusion. And it's this confusion of for only a sine wave is a half a cycle late, indistinguishable from polarity inversion. As soon as it's more complex than a sine wave, it's not confusing at all. Right. Um, can I play you some pink noise? Yeah. Can you hear that? And how's the level? I can't actually hear it. I got to turn it on. Here we go. How's the level? Yeah, it's pretty good. Okay. So that's just pink noise. And then I just added the exact same signal with opposite polarity. Right. And it cancels completely out. Now, if instead of inverting the polarity, I use a very short delay. You immediately hear the what's happening. Certain frequencies are getting supported, constructive interference, and certain frequencies are getting canceled, destructive interference. And uh, I don't remember who mentioned Insight as the fabulous... analysis tool, but there's the spectrum. And then you can see all the peaks and notches and you hear those there. And if I change the delay time, you'll hear all the comb filtering shift. That's great. Great example. Yeah, go ahead. So Marty. that go, is, oh, yeah, go ahead. keep going, Jeff. That is pink noise and late pink noise, time shifted pink noise added together. So you're hearing those two have all kinds of phase constructive interference getting louder and phase destructive interference. And it happens at different frequencies. And this, because that f filter looks like the teeth of a comb, we call that a comb filter. And it's a series of peaks and notches in the frequency response. It keeps on going up. And it's interesting, you know, like it, it makes more sense when you're looking at a, if you, if you're trying to delay something and you delay one channel, suddenly everything sounds super wide, you know, like it, it sounds overly stereo because that timing has changed between the left and the right. Um, go ahead, Marty. Yeah, Jeff and I are, are thinking very much alike. Um, I have uh, also insight and this is looking at white noise, which is a different kind of noise, but it in incorporates all frequencies at equal level, right? And so um, I'm, we're looking right now at two channels at the same time, right? So what, if we introduce a time delay into one of them, I'm going to introduce a one millisecond delay you see the uh, destructive interference that happens. So all of these little notches, and you know, just, just so people understand, the left side is low frequencies, the right side is high frequencies, and it's continuous in between. So you're losing all of those sounds that are inside those notches. And that's two microphones at one foot apart. If I introduce a two millisecond delay or two feet apart, as I showed in my other, you see the notches are different, they're closer together. So you're losing a lot more of the sound. And if we go to uh, three milliseconds, all right, 
we go here. Now, um, I'm going to go back to one millisecond. And I'm going to change the frequency. I'm going to go up a little bit. Oh, no, it's not the frequency because this is all frequencies. Um, so, but you can see how it's frequency dependent because the higher in frequency you get, the more losses you get, right? Right. Now, um, this can be useful, actually. It's not always destructive. Uh, polarity inversions can be very useful. Uh, if you are working uh, on stage, for example, and you have microphones with floor monitors in front of them, and you're getting some sort of uh, feedback, or uh, if you're getting feedback, or that microphone is hearing the floor monitor, if you invert the phase, no, invert the polarity of the floor monitor feed, now you have that polarity difference between the microphone and the, what it's hearing from the floor monitor, and that can be helpful in canceling out feedback um, or reverberation. Um, so there are ways to actually use these tools to your advantage. If you, if you put a time delay into that monitor, you're now... Um, of a few milliseconds, uh, several milliseconds, you're now effectively virtually and electrically, but not physically, moving that monitor further away from the microphone because you're introducing a time delay as if you were physically moving the speaker, but you're not. Right. Mitchell? This, it's interesting to put all of this into perspective is why uh, do we uh, are concerned with phase and timing and things like that. And you think about how we evolved on the Serengeti Desert or wherever we happen to be. Um, and the, just that tiny space between our ears allowed us to hear an attacking creature. And we could tell where it was and how close it was to us uh, in just that instant. Your brain has so much wet work that's going on in there that's processing all of these things that we're talking about. And it's a, it's a very interesting subject from that standpoint, taking it all the way to the, the very scientific point of view. Just thought I'd point that out. Echo Cordy. Yeah, noise canceling microphones. If you think of the uh, commentators' microphones that you see in Europe a lot, that are these lip microphones that have this little lip guard, use uh, a lot of them use dual dynamic uh, uh, capsules faced 180 degrees apart. And by positioning your lip very care, your mouth very carefully closer to the one dynamic element, and 180 degrees out of phase with the second dynamic element, it cancels all the background sound around you and only gets your voice because the cancellation of the sounds entering from both sides equally at the same time cancel out and your voice coming in from one side uh, is the only thing that generates a voltage then in that respect. Let's go ahead and jump into the questions. All right, here we go. Uh, next question from Nigel DeSalle from Austin, Texas. What are the problems we might experience if we have phasing problems? Go ahead, Javier. One of the most uh, common things that happen is when you're capturing a single sound with two sources or more. So the two more common places that I hear this is the first one is in drum kits. So you put like a lot of microphones in a drum kit and then you open the overhead mics and the, you lose the center because of what Marty and Jeff have been saying about the time difference, especially the things that are uh, clo uh, uh, further away from the mics because their 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 level would be kind of close in the center but uh, when you sum them up if they have not uh, correct face alignment they're gonna disappear and then or sometimes you have the overheads and they sound perfect and when you uh, get the fader of the bass drum or the or the snare drum up since that's the thing that it's in the middle it disappears or not not completely because like uh, completely disappearing a signal in the acoustic world is hard but you lose frequencies or sometimes your bass drum uh, is loses the weight or loses the definition and the other place when I hear this a lot is when uh, they're using lavalier mics uh, and one actor comes close to another and you can hear the like the the comp filtering they walk through each other when you keep all the lavaliers open uh, and it sounds weird like it's like a DJ EQing the, the the dialogue so you have to keep those things in mind when you're recording and mixing I go Jeff yeah so anytime you're going to get the same sound twice so whether that's the same 
one sound source picked up by two microphones. So if you have a, this happens all the time in churches, you have a lay reader at a lectern with a gooseneck podium mic, and then the pastor comes up and they're wearing a headset mic and someone forgets to turn off the lectern mic. And now that pastor is being amplified by two microphones that are getting mixed together and they're different distances away. And even worse, the pastor may be moving and you get this kind of comb filtering. Um, so I don't know if you'll be able to hear this, but even try this at home. If you're talking and you get a piece of paper, and so a piece of paper is even reflective enough to cause, you can hear a little bit of shift to my voice as I'm talking and moving this paper around because you're getting the reflection off of this paper into the microphone. So I will hear this in, in stage plays. You can actually hear mic'd actors if they're reading something or you know choirs or something. The, the, actually, the reflection you get just off of paper or a book can cause problems. So acoustic reflections or two microphones. Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Walking into a bar or a venue where a speaker is out of phase is very dramatic. Um, and all you have to do is switch the uh, the connections on one of the speakers. Uh, That's one of my pet peeves is hearing speakers out, out of phase. Out of polarity, Mitchell. Polarity, that's what I meant. Reverse what polarity. I Whatever I said. Did I say phase? Excuse me. I meant polarity. You're right. Switch the wires. Uh, next question. Next question from Tom Ferguson in Phoenix, Arizona, and here in our panel. Tom asks, in a theater, how does phase relate to the best seat in the house? Go ahead, Marty. Well, now we're getting into acoustics. <clears throat> and um, um, first I'll say stay tuned because the audio team here is, is planning a show on live audio. Um, <clears throat> But to give a, a preview, uh, if you're in a theater, um, you have <clears throat> left and right speakers. And if you sit, you know, equal distance from them, <clears throat> you'll have the same distance. And so you will hear the direct sound from the speakers at the same time. If you sit offset closer to one speaker than another, then you'll have that timing difference. Um, but you also have all of the reflections in the room that are adding to what you're hearing. And they will sort of uh, reduce the effect of phasing because everything is being added together. Having said that, I do know of one movie theater here in Silver Spring, Maryland. It's a very, very nice movie theater. Um, they have this problem called uh, Power Alley where, and this is uh, very common if you're setting up a PA system uh, with subwoofers and you space the subwoofers to the left and right under your main speakers. What happens is that right down the center of the theater or the uh, area, those two subwoofers add together. And um, so th they will actually double the volume right, right down the center. And as you get off center, they start um, interfering with each other and you'll get null zones where the bass will drop off severely and then come back as you get farther and farther apart. And so there are a lot of uneven coverage. Now in this particular theater, they have that. And then they have a hard wall in the back of the room that reflects the bass back to the front. And then it reflects off of the movie theater uh, screen. And so you have this bouncing effect. And so if you sit in the middle of the theater, you have what you, what you hear is dialogue multiple times because of the reflections going back and forth. Interesting. So I do sit off center in that theater. <laughs> Very good. Go ahead, Jeff. So Marty and I showed uh, comb filtering when we had exactly the same piece of audio with a very precise delay, and you get these perfect doublings and perfect cancellations. Out in the real world, as Marty said, it gets much more complex because we get lots of reflections. So all of this gets washed out. Um, the example I gave with the piece of paper is much less of an effect because the reflection is not as loud as the original. It's not exactly the same audio. So anytime you can get those reflections quieter, you're gonna reduce the phasing comb filtering issues. Um, in a cinema, in a movie theater, most movie is done with three channels across the front of the screen because dialogue is going to be in the center. 
and a, and a speaker directly behind the screen. That way, even if a person is sitting off to the side, they're going to hear dialogue from a physical speaker behind the screen so that they localize to that. If we tried to use just the left and the right and play them at equal level, what we call a phantom center, the right channel, if you're sitting on the left, is going to arrive much later and you're going to localize it to the left and it's not going to appear to be coming from the person who's speaking on screen. Go ahead, Courtney. Maybe Jeff or uh, Marty can talk to us about how they emulate Atmos with a two speakers that are inside a television set because my Samsung TV has two internal speakers that are downward firing that can generate these localized sounds that don't seem to be coming from the, the TV itself uh, because it uses a special special decoder, uh, Atmos decoder that changes the frequencies from different sides to make it seem like there are speakers in front of you, speakers behind you, and speakers above you. So explain that to me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get someone on to talk about Atmos in general. The, the one that is the most magical is the Sennheiser Ambio uh, soundbar. I don't understand at all. Like I was in a pretty complex room and we sat there and I could hear like it's using all of these things and we should get someone on to come talk, talk to us about it. It was just stunning. I was just like, I couldn't believe that I was hearing what I was hearing and I couldn't put my finger on how to, you know, how that even worked. Cause it was just one, one bar and I think in a, in a sub and, and it was just amazing. Yeah. It's, it's a really fascinating problem. We'll see if we can get somebody on to talk about that. Uh, next question. Uh, from Javier Alfaro from Mexico City, Mexico, and right here on our panel, how can you take advantage of phase variations when miking a guitar amp or other instruments? Good, Marty. Well, so we're talking about effects, right? We're talking about naturally occurring effects using acoustics and microphone spacing. So um, you can, uh, any, any spacing that works for you in that particular room with those particular acoustics, uh, a lot of re uh, recording studios have variable acoustics. So the, the walls can be absorptive, they can be reflective, they can be refractive. Um, you can have a carpet on the floor or a hardwood floor. And so you can create um, many different sounds by varying the acoustics in the studio. If you're working on stage, uh, if you're working on stage, you really have to be conscious of where you put these amplifiers. Um, something that uh, bass players need to be particularly uh, conscious of, and, and most are not aware of this. So you remember we showed um, how you can... Uh, <clears throat> at a distance, completely cancel out the sound, all right? So I showed one slide where the second microphone was uh, five feet away from the drum, uh, causing a five millisecond delay at 100 hertz. We'll cancel each other out. If you put a bass amplifier two and a half feet away from a wall, so the total distance from the amplifier and the reflection back to the amp is five feet. You will be canceling out your sound from that amplifier at 100 hertz, which is a critical frequency for, for, for bass amplifiers. So you need to be aware of where you're putting it and what your boundaries are. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you can put microphones almost anywhere that, you know, sounds good to you. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. So it's not uncommon to mic a uh, guitar amp for recording with a close mic right up on the speaker and then one a little bit farther back, a few feet back to get uh, some room sound. And if that's three feet back, if you put those in the same channel and mix them together, that will have all kinds of comb filtering phasing issues. Um, now, if you put them in two different channels, one to the left and one to the right, now you all of a sudden have this beautiful wide guitar until, of course, you hit the mono button and someone hears your mix in mono, and then you're back to your comb filtering problems. So oftentimes we will use uh, delay, or if it's a recording situation, we can shift the later mic in time earlier to make them match up. Similar things happen with a mic'd bass cabinet and a direct bass eye, the direct uh, through a direct box is pretty instantaneous. Whereas if the mic is six inches or a foot back from the bass amp, that takes a millisecond for that sound to arrive at the microphone. So that will cause comb filtering and these bass cancellations. And as Marty said, these long, low frequency 
and they have very long wavelengths, they're easy to get these uh, large cancellations because of this time we're talking about. Next question. From Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. What role does air temp play in affecting the phase? I go ahead, Mitchell. Um, it's the same way that when you're uh, listening to a stadium or a concert happening way in a distance and the wind's blowing and you hear things, it, it, the, the sound tends to go up and down. Uh, different temperatures of air change the speed of sound. And when you mix all that together in a uh, certain environment, uh, you can get all kinds of weird phase uh, additions and cancellations. Go ahead, Courtney. Exactly right. The speed of sound changes with the temperature of the air around it. Um, I, I worked on a on the speed of sound run where a car was trying to break the sound barrier, and we would only run it early in the morning in the desert when the temperature was very low because the speed of sound is easier to beat when it's at a... Uh, <laughs> At a low temperature, so uh, of course it would the the temperature of the air affects the uh, speed that sound travels through the air and affects the phase or the delay. And I think you can hear that a lot if you go to a, like a festival, like a, a festival with a lot of open speakers, and you'll hear it just swirling all over, all around you all the time um, in a way that I don't really enjoy very much, <laughs> which is why I don't go to a lot of festivals. <laughs> so yeah, I think ahead. that has more to do with the water content of the air, the the humidity. The, oh yeah, yeah, the, the, the and it's, it's not not great. No, next question. Tom Ferguson, Phoenix, Arizona, asked, and he's here on the panel. How do you use phase delay to an advantage rather than disadvantage? Code Mitchell. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure that this is delay, but it certainly is phasing. Um, so I'm not quite ask, answering the question. But basically, uh, when I was uh, a radio DJ, our engineer used to take two mics, hook one out of polar, uh, uh, change the polarity to get the phase to be out of uh, out of uh, one oh, no, mic. We're making it confusing. And, <laughs> and you would talk into one mic. Anyhow, you use two mics out of phase. Boom. Yeah, they're out of polarity, not out of phase. Um, go ahead, Jeff. So uh, spaced microphones uses that time of arrival for its advantage to give you its stereo. So anytime we you know do a stereo mic technique that is spaced microphones, we're using that phase delay to our advantage. That's giving us our localization. Go ahead, uh, Ken. Oh, can't hear you, Ken. Still can't hear you, Ken. Marty? So, um, yeah, so if you uh, watch any of the Grateful Dead movies, concert movies, you will see that they um, have two microphones on the stand, one directly above the other one. And w what you don't see is that one is out of polarity with the other one. And what that does is it, it cancels all of the ambient noise from the stage, and you'll see that they're only singing into the top one. Right, they're singing directly into the top one, so only one channel is getting the vocal, but both channels are getting the ambient stage sound, which gets canceled out, and they get better audio that way. Go ahead, Ken. Phase delay to an advantage, a musical selection called Ichiku Park from the small faces from long ago used phase delay variable as a flanging ex uh, effect. Next question. Next question from Eric Billings in Washington, D.C. Is cable length selection used to control or adjust phasing, or are corrections done only by solid-state electronics? Go ahead, Jeff. So the times we're talking about, sound in the air is pretty slow. Uh, audio as electricity, electricity in a wire is really fast. Uh, I don't know what the actual number is. Someone once told me a third the speed of light. So we kind of consider uh, electricity to be instantaneous. So the length of a cable doesn't really work. Though uh, at one point there was a box that would do very fine uh, clocking changes. So you could pass a square wave into it and it had switches to switch in 50 feet of coax cable. And it had you know something like 500 feet of coax cable in the box that would give you picosecond delays. But that's not what we're talking about here for audio. That was for, for aligning clocks before we had better means to do it. That's great. Marty? So in the days of analog radio, uh, when I was in engineering, we would use uh, telephone wire, telephone pairs that provided by the telephone company to for us to send our signal from the uh, studio 
to the transmitter, which can be tens or hundreds of miles away. And we're doing this in stereo. And so that's two pairs of wire from the phone company. And there's never any guarantee that those two pairs of wires are going to take the same path or be the same length. And so there were frequently time differences. And what we would do is um, put capacitors or inductors, coils of wire, device, electronic devices that actually cause additional delays, and we would put them on the path that arrived first so that it would match the time of the later arriving signal so that they arrived at the same time. I also remember when cameras were RGB um, and you had to run wire from the camera to the switcher, you had three wires. Sometimes the wires didn't have the same speed, the same propagation speed. And so there would be a timing differences between your red, green, and blue. And you had to make some adjustments there as well. So over longer distances and depending on the frequency of the signal, um, wire length can certainly make a difference. Good, Courtney. Yeah, as Jeff was pointing out, uh, speed of sound through air is uh, about 1,100 feet per second. So um, as you move further away from your sound source, you get 1,100 feet. It's going to be a second delayed. Of course, transferred through a wire, it's a third of the speed allowed. That's 5,280 uh, miles per second. So there's a big difference, the speed of light versus the speed of sound through air. <laughs> and uh, in slight slight off off, off subject in, in, when i grew up on a farm we used to the, the difference between the lightning and the sound told us how far away the storm was and we knew whether we should go in or not we, we usually found that at about 12 seconds uh, seven seconds was like you should really go in and 12 seconds was like you should probably start moving that direction next question next question for tom ferguson phoenix arizona can phase result in unwanted change in tone or volume when mixing javier uh, definitely. Have you been seeing that um, different um, difference in phase? It creates this comp filtering that it makes some frequencies higher and some frequencies lower. So you're definitely going to see, uh, well, hear a uh, tone difference. And also, since our ears don't uh, listen, like uh, all the frequencies, we don't perceive it the same. We are more sensitive to some and to others. So you're definitely going to hear uh, volume differences. It's very common in untreated uh, mixing rooms that you, if you, I don't know, like you mix a drum kit and you equalize, especially the things in the center are going to vary a lot uh, from a untreated room from a treated room because sometimes you hear like the like the lower uh, like lower frequencies are getting like uh, summed up and you take decisions and you cut them out and everything and when you listen back to in, in a treated space or a best uh, headphones or something you notice that you cut too much but it, and it was because of phase problems between your speakers the room and your ears so for sure yeah hey, go ahead marty so even polarity can make a difference in tone. And I know this because in the recording studio where we have optimum acoustics in the room and a very expensive microphone and we have a singer and we're recording that singer and we would look at their um, signal on an oscilloscope. And what we found was that people's voices are not symmetrical the waveform that is positive above the center line is not the same as the waveform in the negative. And so when we flip the polarity on that person, we hear a different tone from them. And sometimes we like a negative polarity better than a positive polarity. Interesting. Interesting. Mitchell, real quick. Marty, remember pin too hot. <laughs> Next question. Next question from Kenny Hampton, Greenville, Illinois. In audio installations, the term electronic amine is used. How is this accomplished and to what end? Go ahead, Jeff. Can't hear you, Jeff. Oh, did we lose Jeff? No, he didn't lose me. I have to unmute. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
So here's a, a, a line, a column of speakers. And the concept here is to control directionality. So if each of these is playing the same audio and you are standing in front of it, so therefore you're equidistant from all the speakers, you will receive them all in time, in phase with each other, and they will constructively interfere and get louder. And if you step off above or below this array, then you will get sound from each of the speakers at a different time and they will deconstructively interfere and it will get quieter. So that controls the direction and this array will shoot its sound forward. But if we delay the output or the input to each of these speakers by a different amount, we can now move the position where you will receive all the sound at the same time. So if we make mm -hmm. the sound at the top come out first and then a millisecond later the next speaker and a millisecond later the next speaker and a millisecond later the next speaker, then you would need to be below this speaker to, have, to be at the position where all of them align. And therefore we've aimed that speaker. So if we have to put this speaker on a flat wall, a vertical wall, we can effectively tilt it downward electronically. We can steer it. Go ahead, Marty. Exactly right. Yeah, it's called electronic steering. And uh, some of these column loudspeakers actually have the ability to create multiple beams. And so in a room where you have audience on the floor and then you have a balcony, you can send one beam down to the floor and another beam up to the balcony and have relatively little sound in between so that sound doesn't bounce off the face of the balcony or off the back wall above people's heads on the floor. Next question. Next one in from Douglas Carmichael. Do virtual room plugins like the Waves NX, and there's a link to it, or Dear VR Pro Alliance. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm reading part of the link. Uh, do they use phase manipulation to simulate a room? Yeah, go ahead, Mitchell. Mostly delay, but some phase. Um, the two in combination with each other can simulate pretty much any environment, especially if you have a convolution print. Next question. Next question is from Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, PA. What physical features of microstone, microphone construction employ selective use of phase and or polarity? Javier? Uh, microphones have this specification called the polar pattern. That is, uh, it refers to where how they capture sound from different uh, places. So, for example, if you have like a directional mic, you have uh, more sound in the front l or almost nothing in the back and then the sides get lit, uh, they get out, they, the sound trails off. And that's because of how the microphone is constructed. I mean, as well as the, the, the mechanism, like dynamic mics only capture sound from one direction. But the, most of them, of the, how they construct the mics and they have some, like, for example, a shotguns mic have different like air uh, traps, they're called, that where sound gets from a different places, they cancel each other. So it's like an acoustic cancellation. Uh, you also have X different frequencies in different levels, as we've been talking about. And also there are mics that have variable polar patterns that can switch from omnidirectional to bidirectional to unidirectional. And most of them take advantage of electrical uh, switches in the polarity of the internal uh, electrics of the microphone. And Marty? Yeah, Javier got it right. Um, you'll notice that um, on a typical cardioid microphone like an SM58 or any S57 or anything else, there are there's the screen that's behind the mic because it's a ball. There's in front and back. Um, on some electrovoice microphones, uh, you'll see a series of ports on the handle, for example. Shotgun microphones that. Where is the capsule in that long tube, right? It's not in the back. It's not in the very front. It's a little bit somewhere in the middle. And the idea is that the microphone is built. The capsule has a cage around it with ports on the back that um, allow in a very controlled fashion sound to get into the, to the diaphragm, the back of the diaphragm, which um, when you have equal sound on the front of the diaphragm and the back of the diaphragm, they cancel each other out. So... This helps create a cardioid or a directional microphone or um, a subcardioid or a supercardioid by controlling how sound gets in. Now go ahead, Jeff. Important to remember that on something like a bidirectional microphone, because it is open on both sides, it's essentially much like that Bodron drum that Marty was showing in his early slide. It's just a diaphragm open on both sides. It will cancel sound from the side, as Marty said, that 
the same pressure on both the front and the back. If there's equal pressure, there's no movement. Um, if you have sound from the back of the microphone, it will be reverse polarity, opposite polarity from the sounds on the front of the microphone. And that goes, that's true for any microphone that has a rear lobe. So not just bidirectionals, but hypercardioids and supercardioids as well. The rear lobe is reverse polarity from the front. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, it's been pretty well covered. The, um, the shotgun microphones like the 416, 816 have uh, what's called an interference tube, which is a long tube with slots along the side. And the slots are at 90 degrees so that they take sound that's reflected and come in those slots uh, 90 degrees out of phase uh, tend to cancel at high frequencies, which give its directionality in uh, very 12 degrees of narrow uh, entrance for the high frequencies. The lower frequencies are a little less directional because uh, they bounce in and they come in from, from all directions there. Uh, the Coles microphone, which I, I showed earlier, there it is, which uh, positions your mouth uh, directly in front is a ribbon microphone. So it's open on the front and on the back. You'll notice there's a screen on the back there, just the same as the screen on the front. And by talking into one side of the ribbon, the other side of the ribbon gets the noise that's not coming from your mouth and cancels it out. Uh, and uses it for noise cancellation. And some some noise canceling microphones like those that are used on headsets and helicopters actually use two dynamic elements facing opposite directions to uh, uh, and out of and some together out of phase uh, electrically or out of polarity, excuse me, uh, <laughs> electrically, so that they uh, cancel out everything that's coming from both directions. Next question. From Jeff Francis in Columbia, South Carolina, how can the use of balanced cables affect polarity? Good, Jeff. I didn't want us to leave phase and polarity before we talked about balanced cables. I was waiting cables. for us to bring it up. I was just like, it was like it's got to come up, and I was, I was, I thought maybe it'd be in a question somewhere down below, and it yeah. is. So well, it is. Up. So, as you see on the bottom here, balanced cables uses use three wires. One wire, which we typically call hot, is the in polarity, the correct polarity audio. The cold is the same audio sent reverse polarity. And then there is a common ground or shield. And this is uh, more correctly called a differential system because the receiver is taking the difference between the positive polarity and the negative polarity signal. So you cancel out things that are common, which is noise that got in introduced along the way. What can happen? Well, we can accidentally miswire our cables. So if we wire a cable that connects hot on one end to cold on the other and cold to hot, then we have inverted the polarity of our audio along the way, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes intentionally. And that's exactly what happened to the, the, the vent that I was talking about earlier. Someone just flipped those, <laughs> flipped those connectors. And what's interesting is while we've been using balanced lines uh, for nearly nearly, I don't know, 100 years, mm -hmm. the actual XLR specification of pin 2 being hot and pin 3 being cold was not established until 1992. Oh, interesting. So only 30 years. And so we had many, 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 many years of audio where things were manufacturers picked whatever they want. If you're using the same <laughs> piece of gear and you go in and out, it doesn't matter. Right. But it's when you have uh, A to D converters. And I believe that my black magic switcher is unfortunately pin three hot and a uh, television studio. Sorry, huh. production studio. Interesting. Interesting. They've not responded to that tech question yet. <laughs> Marty. Yeah, Jeff covered it. And yeah, we used to have pin three hot on a lot of pieces of gear, especially um, video gear that had audio with it, like video tape recorders, for example, remember those? <laughs> um, a lot of them had pin three hot, and so you'd have to know what you were uh, working with, and you would have to test every cable and uh, know what you're going into. You go ahead, Mitchell. So, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, you guys covered it well. I mean, uh, the differential cable connections, pin two hot, pin, th pin three hot, uh, brouhaha, in Europe, particularly in, um, uh, in the UK, uh, pin three hot was the thing for the longest time. And mm -hmm. uh, so that caused some people some confusion when they started mixing the two. It's not a problem if you don't, if you stay with that as a standard, but if you start mixing them, uh, once that uh, wiring gets uh, reversed, um, it will knock the, the waveform out of phase 
and I, therefore you've got a problem with other stuff around it. I have a hard time getting around that. I uh, need, just try not to, <laughs> to try. Let's go ahead, Courtney. Uh, and uh, as far as balanced cables go, uh, Canary has something called Star Quad, which uses actually two wires per each connector, two wires for hot, two wires for uh, cold, and then a common shield. And uh, they're twisted, uh, they're double twisted, so they're helically wound. And that also does a great deal since they're not running parallel, inductive noise gets canceled out uh, in each of the helical legs. And then the two legs are, are out of polarity. So uh, for the inducted noise, but not for your signal. And so that helps cancel. That's why the uh, uh, star quad cables do a much better job of eliminating hum and inducted uh, uh, noise, you know, noise that can come from electrical fields that you run that cable through. Next question. Next question from Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, PA. What considerations of phase and polarity must be understood when selecting the polar pattern of a microphone. Go ahead, Marty. Well, let's see. When I'm selecting a microphone and choosing what polar pattern, I'm thinking about what's the direction of the sore, of the sound that I want to pick up and what's the direction of any sounds that I want to reject. And that has to do with you know, how the microphone is constructed because it uses phase and polarity acoustically to produce a cardioid, subcardioid, supercardioid line, uh, a line microphone, which is also known as a shotgun, um, <clears throat> and how I position the microphone. So if I'm doing an interview, for example, um, I have a person sitting in a chair and somewhere in the room there's an air vent that is, you know, rumbling. And so I would position the microphone so that the polar pattern is picking up the person that is speaking, but the rejection pattern, and so on a cardioid microphone, the rejection pattern is directly in the back of the mic, would be pointing at the um, air vent. In a super uh, hypercardioid microphone, when you look at the polar patterns, the rejection angles are at 120 degrees, so not directly behind, but kind of 45 degrees off of the sides. And so I would <clears throat> position the microphone to so that it's not hearing sounds that I don't want to hear. On stage, this also comes in when we have floor monitors with vocalists. So if there's one vocalist and the floor monitor is directly in front of them, I would use a cardioid microphone. If they have two floor monitors, one to the left, one to the right, I would use a hypercardioid microphone. Good, Javier. Uh, yeah, definitely the acoustics of the of the room are the most important part when taking uh, when deciding the polar part pattern because different frequencies are gonna uh, bounce in from different surfaces and uh, sometimes if you have a variable polar pattern microphone you can test this and it's very uh, it's very interesting because it's like EQing without touching an EQ so sometimes you have a singer and you have an for example a 414 like the one Mitch uses uh, you can switch the polar pattern from omnidirectional to bidirectional to uh, cardioid and just without moving the microphone if you switch just the polar pattern you're gonna notice that some frequencies go up and some frequencies go down and you can actually like enhance like the maybe for the verse you want the the voice to be smoother without the harsh like uh, like sparkling of the high frequencies and maybe for the chorus you want the other thing around and you don't have to EQ just just change the polar pattern or use a microphone with a different polar pattern that's gonna give capture reflection from the room and a different frequencies from different levels good Courtney it could take up a whole second hour, but phase array microphones that are used in conference rooms that use multiple microphones in an array, and then careful timing algorithms to be able to uh, adjust its directionality in real time uh, to pick up one particular speaker and reject all the other people speaking in the room uh, is common now. And since uh, we have computers and electronics that can react uh, quickly and can adjust the mixing of those phase arrays that can uh, achieve a, a variable polar pattern uh, that can be mixed according to the amount of sound coming from a specific direction on the fly. Next question. 
Next question in from Douglas Carmichael. When would you use a phase correction plugin like the Waves in phase? Go ahead, Javier. Uh, when you receive a recording that it's that has phased problems. If you're recording it yourself, don't use plugins. Try to solve the problem with mic positioning, with moving the sources, with all of that, that thing. If you receive a mix, uh, like a song that you have to mix, for example, I've used it in drums, like the, the, that example where you put the overheads and then you pull up the bass drum and everything goes down in level or down in intensity. That's, that's a good uh, job for those plugins. You can you uh, you can do it by hand, like the, the like uh, delaying different channels. But those plugins may help you in, in those situations. But if you can uh, avoid it, try to help uh, to do it in in recording. And the last question from Tom Ferguson in Phoenix, Arizona, right here on our panel: white noise, pink noise. What's the difference in various colors? Go ahead, Jeff. The white noise is equal energy per frequency, and if you take our Frequency range of humans from 20 to 20 kilohertz, cut that in half. You should have the same energy from zero up to 10 kilohertz and 10 kilohertz up to 20 kilohertz. And if you know anything about 10 kilohertz, it's a pretty high frequency. So white noise is gonna sound like very bright static. Pink noise is equal energy per octave. So it's gonna have a better balanced sound of highs and mids and lows. So there's pink, and there's white. Interesting. Uh, Marty. Right, so we tend to use pink noise for acoustics because it is equal energy per octave in, um, in acoustic energy, and uh, we, I, can, I can show that as well. So that's pink noise. Uh, we use white noise in electronics, so if we're looking at a wire, um, so we would use the white noise because that is equal voltage per frequency, per octave. That's great. It's a good discussion. <laughs> we got through a lot. I think it's an important discussion for us to have. You know, these, these kind of technical discussions are important because it really just starts to ground us a little bit. Um, <laughs> I know, but, but ground us... Um, in, in understanding what it is and digging into these um, subjects allows us to be a little bit wiser when we listen to it and at least have that language to start digging into that. So um, thanks to thanks to everybody who came on, especially I, I, know, I know Jeff and Marty really kind of prepped for this a bit. And uh, so thanks, thanks for that work and um, really, really uncovered a lot of things. And that, this is what I hope that we can keep on doing for the audio, the audio uh, days is just really dig into stuff and make sure that we uh, understand it. So really, really well done. A great, great second hour. Uh, a couple of reminders that tomorrow uh, Felipe Baez will be on to talk about Resolve on the iPad. It's in beta and a lot of people are talking about it. So he's going to be uh, making sure that or giving us a little, uh, a little test run and showing us what it can do and what it can't do. Uh, we got labs today, Stream Deck. And there's going to be a Stream Deck lab today. Um, also a reader workshop. Um, if you're interested in the readers, contact Mitchell. Um, to, to, to figure out how to get into those things. Um, and then also conversations with Tony Mobley is tonight. Um, it's, a, it's a behind the scenes. Oh, there, it's, there's gonna be behind the scenes breakout. So when he does his show tonight, uh, you can actually jump into the behind the scenes and, and see, listen to the comms and see how it all gets done. So it's a pretty, pretty uh, great experience there. Um, Tlaloc Traversal. 44,000 miles uh, we covered today, 71,000 uh, kilometers. Um, and that is more than 399 million bananas for scale, you know. All right. Thanks to our producers uh, for, um, uh, for all the great questions and keeping this conversation moving forward. And uh, thanks to the panelists. Uh, really, really good two hours here. So thank, thanks so much. Uh, it's great. Just a reminder, Wednesdays are our audio day. So if you've got audio questions, this is just such a great panel to, to ask those in. So, so definitely jump on and ask those questions on Wednesdays. Uh, and thanks to the panelists for making that worth it. And uh, thanks to the incredible crew on the back end that's making this happen every single day, seven days a week. We are very, very close to a thousand. <laughs> we're going to be in a thousand days straight uh, in, in just a little over a week. So, um, so stay tuned for that. All right, let's go ahead and jump into After Hours. Maybe we'll jump in. See, I'm, I'm whispering. We don't even have the credits yet, but I, this is what happens. Just remember, 
if it's a binary choice, it's polarity. Yes. But whisper louder to wake up the people in the back. Yeah. <laughs> Does that mean if I definitely disagree with someone, I'm just going to say we're out of polarity. But if I kind of, if I kind of don't, I don't know if they're right or wrong, then I'll say we're out of phase. phase You're phase. just out of sync with them then. <laughs> it's semantics. Just to be in phase with you, Jeff. <laughs> I guess we're out. <laughs>